This video is sponsored by the following people. Please click the links in the description below. There's many ways to skin this cat, but if you want to do it properly, temperature controlled is, is the best way to do it. I'm Graham Clark. I'm a metallurgist by profession and I run Clark Knives in rural Wiltshire where we run knife making courses and we also run a heat treatment service for knife makers and we make Damascus steel billets which we sell out to other knife makers. What you need is temperature control. And that's what it's all about. You may have seen a previous video where we were talking about normalizing. So normalizing, you've got to heat it up 30 degrees above the maximum hardening temperature, let it cool down again, your grain size will be all the right size. It's all about having everything at the right temperature. And to my mind, that's not easy to do if you haven't got a control system. I.e., if you're heat drinking out of a forge, whether that be a gas-fired forge or a coke-driven forge, you haven't got that kind of control. It can work. And there are plenty of people who can make it work beautifully. But there are some pitfalls to be careful of. Let's deal with the basic equipment. You've got a forge, whether that be gas or coal or coke, but you've got a means of getting your metal hot. The only real control that you've got to ensure you've got the right temperature is a magnet, which has got very limited use, and your eyes. And then hopefully you've downloaded a color chart off the internet so that you know what color represents what temperature. You've got to get that temperature about right. Interpreting those colors can take a bit of practice. Believe me, it does take a bit of practice. I've done it. I, I'm quite good at judging by temperature but once i bought myself an infrared pyrometer that's a little gun you can shoot at it at the metal and measure the temperature i realized i wasn't quite as good as i thought i was so these are the ways you can get around it if you haven't got a proper heat treatment oven proper heat treatment ovens are not cheap I know that. As far as I'm aware, you can spend a couple of thousand pounds on them. But you've got to get that temperature right. If you're hardening from too low a temperature, you are not going to harden up. You go from this crystal structure, which is body center cubic, it gets hot, it goes face center cubic. Once it's in the face center cubic, your little carbides dissolve. So the carbon atoms start floating around within the solid material, but they start moving around because they're very small. And then when you come to quench it, so you've got everything up at the right temperature, you've got to get above the minimum hardening temperature. And again, every steel that you buy has got a specified hardening range a minimum and a maximum temperature once you get above the minimum temperature you know that all the alloys have all dissolved up and they're all moving around freely it's almost like a cup of tea with your sugar dissolved in it it's all moving around and mixed together you then got to quench it to make it hard so you've got to have that temperature correct if it's not hot enough your solute atoms as we call them the alloying elements have not dissolved up properly if it's too high a temperature your crystals are getting too big they're getting too large for the recommended size so that when you quench them yes they'll come lovely and hard but they won't have the ductility that you would hope for ductility might sound like a strange word when you're talking about a hardened knife we all know how easy they are to snap them you know if you're trying to straighten them but it does make a difference if the grain size is correct you're going to get the ultimate properties out of it if it's if it's correct so getting quenching from the right temperature is critical and you need the same temperature over the whole blade so that when it quenches it all reacts properly I use an electric fired furnace. It's got a thermocouple inside. It's got a programmer on the side so that as it's approaching temperature, it starts to shut the furnace off before it gets to temperature so it doesn't overshoot. And we can control and heat treat from the right temperature. That is the ideal setup. It's a professional setup. But if you haven't got that, then you've got to use your forge. Color charts work well. The magnet is be careful because theoretically it will lose its magnetism at 723 iron does anyway pure iron in practical terms in alloys is normally about 760 i think they call it the magnetic point where the magnet will suddenly drop off it loses its magnetism 760 where well, you might just harden up a piece of 1080 from that temperature anything else needs to be a little bit higher you get to something like a 52 100 you want to be up uh, so 860 870 you know you're another 100 degrees higher how do you know you're another 100 degrees higher well the only way you've got it is either to know your colors extremely well have an infrared pyrometer you can shoot at it and check your temperature or have a proper temperature controlled oven where you know the oven's sitting at the right temperature you can let the thing soak dissolves up all the solute atoms and when you quench you're going to get the best properties yeah you can use a variety of different bits of equipment blimey i've even i've told a story before about my granddad heat treating a screwdriver knife using a paraffin blow lamp and he got the tip nice and red and it came hard and it worked a treat there's many ways to skin this cat but if you want to do it properly temperature control is, is the best way to do it. So you've got this piece of metal now, it's nice and hot, it's at your hardening temperature, 
you gotta quench it. What does quenching mean? Quenching means that you're gonna cool it fast enough that you are gonna generate the ultimate properties in the piece of steel. If you don't quench it fast enough, get a slack quench, it doesn't harden up properly. What you're doing during the quench is you've got a crystal structure like this, it wants to move to a crystal structure like that, but to get from there to there, the steel takes time. And if you don't give it enough time, it's gonna force itself into something different, which is a completely different shape altogether. Instead of being nice little cubes, they're nice elongated rectangles. It's called martensite for those we want the technical word for it. But in order to get martensite to form correctly, and in order to get 100% or as near to 100% martensite as you can, you've got to cool it at the correct speed. What do we mean by speed? The fastest quench I know is brine, salty water. You can either put 15% of salt into pure water, 3% caustic soda will do exactly the same job, though it's a little bit more dangerous to use. I once used to heat treat motor car gudgeon pins. I used to do about five tons a week off them, and they all had to be quenched into brine because they had to be quenched extremely quickly. That is as fast as you can get. Then you get oils. Now, oils come in different quench speed. You basically get a fast, a medium, a slow, and probably a few other bits in, in between. I'll explain to you in a minute how you can vary the speed of the quench oil. And then you got air. You get forced air. You can hang a hot piece of metal up and blow compressed air over it or put it in front of a fan. Or you can cool it in still air. Or you can cool it in the furnace. If you're trying to anneal something, you leave it in the furnace and let it cool down very slowly. Sometimes, particularly for say something like a high speed steel or a very high alloy chrome steel, even letting it cool in the furnace won't cool it won't soften it enough and you've actually got to say it must only cool down at say 20 degrees c per hour and you've got to have a programmable controller that will put heat back into the furnace as it's cooling down so that it only cools down at a certain rate and then you'll get the give it time for all these atoms to rearrange themselves how they want to that is all quenching. Whether it's annealing or whether it's quenching into brine, it is all quenching. Now, to get back to practical purposes for knives, we generally gonna use either a fast or a medium speed quench oil. So if you haven't got many alloying elements in, you've got a plain carbon steel. We're talking now 1070s, 1080s, 1095s, even some of the higher alloys which have still basically a plain carbon steel. Some of your Japanese blue paper steels or 26C3, which I think is about a 1.2 or 1.4% carbon, plain carbon steel. They still got to be quenched pretty quickly. Otherwise they won't come hard. I'm not going to go into the technical detail of how that happens, but a plain carbon steel generally has to be quenched as pretty quick, but water is generally a bit too fast. It's a bit too severe and the chances of cracking are very high. But you can get certain accelerated quench oils. One of them even advertises quenches nearly as fast as water. Well, it doesn't quench nearly as fast as water, but it does. It is a bloody fast quench oil, which is great and it works. Now, how this is done, there is a big drawback with quenching into oil, and that is what is known as soft spots. Now, industrially, you get a very big block of steel and you put it into a plain oil. What happens is that oil is red hot and that is way above the boiling point of the oil. So you put Put a big block of steel in and the oil starts to boil. Now you can get built up on the side, you can get a bubble of oil vapor which sort of sticks to the side of the block. That stops fresh oil from getting onto that hot metal. So now all of a sudden you're actually insulating that part of the metal. So it might be you've got a lot of activity over here but you might have a sort of sheltered spot around here where the oil is not moving so quickly and you get a vapor block build up. That part doesn't cool very quickly and if you go and hardness test all over the surface. We're talking about we're not talking about knives now we're talking about big blocks but this is the effect that can happen. You get this vapor bubble built up on the side. When it's finished quenching you go and test it you get soft spots. Now, that spot where that air bu that vapor bubble was isn't quenched properly. That is something which can happen in any kind of oil, but if you've got a proper quench oil, it's not gonna happen so much. So what do I mean by a proper quench oil? Again, Mr. Google knows a lot of things, and he knows that you can use sunflower oil, you can use old engine oil, you can use rapeseed oil. I don't recommend any. What I do recommend is a pucker, properly formulated mineral quench oil. There are also water-based quenchants. Very good, they don't catch fire, but they've got their inherent problems. So let's start back with a basic oil. We're not gonna use water because nothing we use to make knives really needs a water quench. Some of them need close to that, but an oil quench is a bit more gentle. A quench oil is basically a plain mineral oil with no additives in it. Because if you start putting additives into oil, like engine oil, which has got lots of additives, detergents to clean your engine and stuff to keep the carbon in suspension, they tend to be low boiling point. So old engine oil is an absolute no-no. Because you start quenching into that and you are gonna start creating 
vapor bubbles all over the place and it won't quench properly. A plain mineral oil, the biggest problem you've got are these bubbles of vapor building up on the surface. When I was a student fresh out of university, I actually managed to do some work on controlling the speed of quench oils. We were making some pretty highfalutin parts, ammunition parts of the British military, and we were getting trouble with soft spots on them. And a company in Birmingham were developing additives to put into these quench oils to cure the problem. And what the additives do, you put your red hot piece of metal into the oil and the oil immediately boils and creates vapor. When it boils, as you'll know, if you've got salty water and you boil it dry, the salt is left behind. The same thing happens with this oil. This additive that's in there, the oil boils on the surface, but the additive settles on the surface of the red hot piece of metal as a little crystal. The heat from that metal causes that little crystal to explode and that breaks up the gas bubble. The more of the additive you put in, the more it breaks up the vapor bubbles as they form on the surface of the steel. So the more fresh oil that can now touch that hot surface, the quicker it quenches. And that's how you control the speed of quench oil. So that's why when you buy 50 speed quench oil or a 32 speed quench oil, they quench at different speed. 50 speed quench oil is pretty fast. A 32 speed quench oil is medium. To be quite honest, those are the only two I have in my shop. I've got two quench tanks right next to my heat treatment furnace. One's got medium, one's got fast speed oil. Knowing the right oil for the material is quite important. You won't get plain carbon steels hard in a medium speed quench oil. Once you go to something like an 80 CRV2, which I think has got about 0.4, 0.5% chromium in it. I'm not quite sure of the, the, the numbers, but it's a 0.8% carbon and a little bit of chrome. That'll harden up beautifully in a medium speed quench oil. The problem is you go with something like into a fast speed quench oil, mm, depends on the format of your knife and the shape and the surface finish you put onto it before you heat treat it, but you stand a chance of cracking it. So you've got to be careful. You've got to get the right oil for the right blade, but it's always there and it's always available. If you're heat treating stainless steel oils, always use a medium speed oil, or if you have access to it, a slow speed oil. I don't find any problems with medium speed oil, but they don't need anything really very fast at all. That is how you control your quenching speed. Hi, this is Vince here. If you're enjoying the videos that we're doing, don't forget to buy one of our merch. Check out patreon.com slash ukbladeshow to support the channel. Don't forget to hit that, that's... Don't forget to hit like. See you in the next video.